Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, before we get started, before we prepare for worship, uh, well, I'd like to welcome our online family. I'm glad you're all here live with us. Uh, I'm going to have Coach Josh Brooks come up, and he's going to do a little announcement for us um, on this handheld mic. Morning. Uh, coming up in two weeks, uh, Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Uh, there'll be a basket out in a narthex for uh, everyone to put um, cards and gifts uh, to show our appreciation for uh, Pastor Kevin and Miss Angela. Uh, obviously, in a time where um, we live in a society where appreciation and thankfulness and uh, respect are not really high on everyone's list. I think what Pastor and his wife have done uh, since March is pretty uh, commendable for our church, our community, um, for individuals uh, that's not even attending our church. So uh, the 18th will be a chance for us to show a small appreciation for what they have done. And uh, if you'll take time to do that, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. As we prepare, prepare for Sunday, usually, how do you, uh, what kind of worship does God deserve? Do you think about that? You know, do you, is it distracted? Are you, are you thinking about all these other things all the time or uh, reluctant? You know, you're, eh, I don't really want to worship that hard. I'm kind of tired this morning. Or manipulative. You're only worshiping because you're trying to get something out of it. Uh, let's think about what God would have us do. I can't offer the Lord my God a sacrifice. Worthy is the Lamb who was 
do something could we just very reverently just just very reverently father I want to thank you for your presence for the presence of the Holy Spirit I want to thank you Lord that together that we can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and reflect the good nature in our worship of uh, the good nature of how we love you and how we adore you father it is so true that all week long we stay so so busy 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 and then you call us you call us towards a time of rest a time of resting in you, a place of solitude, a place of Sabbath. And I pray that today, God, would be a day that the people of God would be, would be recharged, burdens would be lifted. And Lord, upon hearing the Word of God, upon hearing the psalms and, the, and, and, and singing the hymns and the spiritual songs, that when we leave here that we can feel lighter because we've, we've, we've allowed you to carry our burdens. We've shifted the burdens that we often carry on our shoulders to you. So, Lord, that's what we do today. We take time out of this service, and we just pause to say thank you. Thank you for goodness. Thank you for your mercy, and thank you for your wonderful grace. We ask all of this in the name of the Lord, and everyone said amen. Would you do me a favor, because I want to have special prayer for a need. So stay standing just for a moment. Um, Elise Sutton, I talked with her husband this week, and... Uh, we, we need to pray. Their, their community, uh, people in our community, um, that um, I had, had the joy of coaching uh, one of their boys in baseball, and Elise needs a touch from God. She really, really needs a touch from God. In fact, she's in need of a miracle. Such a beautiful young family, and we need to see God touch. Could, could you pray with me? Lord, I'm asking that you would dissolve tumors, that you would do only what you can do, by the mighty hand of God. I pray along with the people of God here at Prentice for a wonderful, wonderful touch in the Sutton's family. We have not because we ask not. So God, we ask in faith and partnership with other believers that you would do a miracle for Elise today. Father, I pray that she would be confident that the Lord can make a way when there seems to be no way. We celebrate your goodness in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said amen. All right. As our children are being dismissed, would you take just a moment? You don't have to get too close, but greet somebody and let them know that it's really, really good to see them in the presence of the Lord and our children are dismissed. God bless you as you are being seated. All right, so good to see everybody today. You look incredible. Let me take just a few moments to visit with you and to just give you a few announcements that are going on in and uh, around the church. Hey, let us still be mindful um, that uh, uh, for, for our nation, to remember our nation in prayer, also to remember those that are battling sickness. I know that we still have some in and around our community that are battling the sickness, so let's, let's pray for them against this virus that God would that God would touch them. Uh, as, as Samuel said, welcome to uh, Prentice, those that are on the live stream. We're so glad that you are, that you are with us and uh, glad that you make us a priority every Sunday because you are on our hearts and we certainly miss you, but we're glad you're online with us. We're going to continue 
our series of messages on the Ten Commandments in just a few moments. But before we do, uh, I, I do have some announcements that, uh, that, that I want to share with you. And I think that you'll be pretty excited, pretty excited to hear about these good announcements. So uh, uh, I hope you're comfortable and I hope you're ready to worship Jesus today. Uh, thank you, Samuel, and to all those that were a part of the worship service. I want to ask Savannah Parker if she will come. Uh, she's coming at this time. We, we, we're excited about launching some small groups, and uh, those are going to be going on in our community. And uh, let me just read something that was on our Facebook page in case you don't have Facebook. And, it, and, and here's what it reads. We are so excited to announce that Savannah Parker will be starting a small group for the college students every Monday evening. Uh, the address and more information is on the event post. A little about Savannah. She's 19 years old and is in her second year of college. Her hobbies include playing basketball, hanging out with friends, and singing. She sings in the church choir pre-COVID and helps lead worship. You can always visit her at Motor Company Grill where she is a server and enjoys her job because she enjoys people. She loves going to church and can't wait to see what God has in store for her small group in her life. We are excited for her and please pray for her and please remember Savannah. So Savannah, I will hand you this and let me ask you a couple of questions, all right? Sounds good. All right. Um, first of all, your parents are good with this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're really yeah. excited for me to start Yeah, this. they're hiding over there. No, no, no. They, they are. They are. If not, they are now, right? No. We, we, we love this family. And you're going to start a small group for, for maybe those graduating high school seniors and those that are out of high school? Yes. Anything so. you want to uh, talk about what you're feeling that your first study is going to be, what you shared with okay, Angela and I? Okay, so um, we are, I'm pulling all of our lessons from um, Right Now Media. And I've um, had a great experience with that. So I'm excited to get that started. My first lesson is going to be about identity. And I feel like a lot of people my age, um, they struggle with identity. They go through a lot to try to find themselves. But um, I think the most important thing is not finding yourself, but finding who you are through Jesus. Because without him, we're nothing. Amen. Amen. And so this small group is going to give an opportunity for those that are in the college or graduating high school to come out on a Monday evening, hang out with Savannah. There'll be uh, some, some fun, possibly some food, and just some hangout time studying in God's Word, right? Yes. Anything you want to add? Um, I will be here a little after church ends if anybody wants more information or I can give you my phone number. We can keep in touch that way. Um, so, yeah, you guys can just catch me out in the North X and uh, come talk to me about it. All right. So let's do this. Let's do this before, uh, before uh, we dismiss her back to her seat. It's very important that we reach people of all ages, and we certainly want to make a difference in the college group, and I'm so thankful that Savannah has a heart to do this. Aren't you? I want to ask you to do this if you feel comfortable, um, uh, just as a point of prayer, because I'm not going to uh, bring everyone down. But if you're comfortable in just reaching your hand forward towards her and this platform, I want to pray a prayer of blessing that God would send her as a missionary into this, uh, into this community. So let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for Savannah and the whole Parker family that, are, uh, that is opening their home. And I pray that a great, a great calling and a great anointing would be upon her life. I pray that as these students come together every Monday to study scripture, that great things would happen. I pray they would have more than fun, they would have more than fellowship, but they would have an experience with Jesus Christ. And even in this first sermon series or this Bible study series on identity, that they truly would understand that without Christ, we are nothing. So we thank you for Savannah Parker and we ask for your touch to be upon our life. And now we pray, we pray for our college students to respond and come out and make a sacrifice and be a part. We ask all of this in the good name of Jesus and everyone said amen. amen. All right. And would you once again, just give her a hand and appreciate her willing to do this. Thank you, Savannah. And you know what? Uh, it takes more than just uh, somebody willing to do it. It takes committed people to say, hey, I'm going to be a part. So I'm going to encourage you to invite nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, uh, and ask them to come out and be a part. You can contact the office for some more information, or as Savannah said, you can meet with her after service and get the necessary information to be a part. I think this is pretty special, and I think it's very important, and we need to, uh, we need to all make it, uh, make it a priority. And you know what? 
but nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. So I certainly don't want Sean and Savannah to be by themselves. Sean, we need, we need college students with you, and we thank you and uh, Crystal for opening up your home. Uh, we appreciate that so much. All right, in addition, uh, we're going to be starting uh, our continuing our small group that we had last year. And um, I, I, Samuel, Samuel was leading worship this morning. The small group that me and Angela lead is at uh, Samuel and Danielle Crabtree's house. Yep, there you are, Samuel. Uh, would you stand for me? Just, just to, uh, I know you're, you're kind of shy. There's Samuel back there standing. You, he is. He really is kind of shy. That's, that's amazing. Uh, you may be seated. Danielle, his wife, are hosting a small group. Me and Angela conduct that. If you want to get with him about details, our first meeting is going to be November 15th. So everything was on pause during COVID. We're starting to open back up, and we're excited to do that. So November 15, we start. Um, and the information on the first college group, let's see, we're two weeks from Monday. Is that right? Yes, Savannah, two weeks from this Monday. In addition, I'm going to put Steve Crabtree on the spot. Steve and Karen, would you stand up just for a moment? Steve and Karen Crabtree, they are going to be starting a small group, and we're going to probably be bouncing between the general store and moto company, just depending on the size of the group. And it's going to be a really, really special time with this couple also studying. Um, you're going to watch a clip of a movie and then break out into some discussion. If you have any questions, see, uh, see Steve Crabtree or Karen, and we appreciate that as well. In addition, I'm coming, Roddy. Roddy, would you stand? Roddy, David, Odell, I don't see uh, David this morning, but Roddy and David, January, I th we're looking at the first or second week of January starting FPU, Financial Peace University with Dave Ramsey. Uh, do you know right offhand how many weeks it is? Is it nine? It's nine weeks of intense discipline, financial discipline, and uh, we're going to be opening that small group. It's going to start in January. So go ahead, go out to eat in November and December. Go ahead and put some things on the credit card if you must for Christmas. Because when January comes, if you sign up for that small group, you're going to have nine weeks of intense financial discipline. And it is, anyone here ever been through FPU? One, two, Roddy, it's been good for you. It is a game changer. It is really a game. How many listen to Dave Ramsey? Anybody? There we go. Quite a few. You're going to love this small group. That's a lot of information. In addition, so we have those four groups. In addition, every Wednesday night, we have a group that meets here. It's my Bible study. Currently, I'm handling this subject, you drive me crazy. Not you, but people. Some people. Come out for it if you can. We have not started our Awana Kids Ministries yet, but we're hoping, we're hoping to just get back into a routine of having some good ministries over the next few months as we feel that, uh, as our council and I feel that it is safe. So that is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. We do 7 to 7.30. We do a Bible study at 7.30. We do a discussion. I really enjoyed the discussion this week. I really, really enjoyed the comments, and the, uh, we take about 30 minutes. We get to know each other. We get to know who's in the room, learn a little bit about one another, and discuss the subject at hand. I get to hear from you, which is very, uh, very important. Finally, on Sundays, we traditionally have our Sunday school time. We've yet to start our Sunday school back. We will do that uh, upon the council and I finding that our teachers are back ready to teach. We're, we're weighing that uh, uh, when is the right time. It's been tricky. Pray for us so that when we will, uh, we will know and we will feel when the right time to start all of these back. We certainly covet your prayers. I appreciate all of you. And I appreciate those that are willing to do things in the community to bring people who are far from Christ. So, so here's what you want to do. You want to edify the people of God, and then you want to reach out to those who do not know Christ. You want to edify the church, and then you want to reach out to people who don't come. And placing these groups strategically in the community will allow us that opportunity. But we need your help. So Wednesday night, you can come this Wednesday, in-house, 7 p.m., or watch us online from 7 to 7.30, 7.30 to 8 o'clock. The discussion's too, 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 too much for live stream, too much. You'll just have to come check it out. We just can't live stream the discussion. Uh, come and check that out. 
all the small groups, see us, call the office if you need some more details about that, and we will launch the Sunday school groups as soon as our teachers are coming back to church. We still got a lot of people, believe it or not, that have yet to return to church, and we are praying for them and asking God's blessings upon them to be safe, and when the time is right, for them to be back with us. Amen? Amen and amen. All right, so there's a few announcements. I hope I covered it all. Uh, Here is something that is on my heart that uh, I want to give to you that I want to ask your participation in. Uh, One way or the other, one way or the other, I want to ask you to participate in a corporate time of fasting and prayer. Um, Over the next 30, 30, 40 days, we need to be a nation of repentance and we need to be a nation of prayer. I don't think anybody would disagree that the people of God should be people of prayer. And um, beginning on October the 12th through October the 21st, um, my wife and I, I can't say my family and I because I can't speak for my two boys, uh, they're carnivores, but my wife and I are going to be our best, uh, do our best to pray over an open Bible daily, Daniel chapter 9, verse 4 through 17. You may, if you want to take a screenshot of that, if you, want to, if you want to take a picture of it, but Daniel chapter 9 and verse 4 through 17 gives you a beautiful prayer. It gives you a beautiful prayer, and it's a prayer of repentance, it's a prayer of corporate repentance, and it's a prayer of personal repentance. We're going to pray over an open Bible. Let me explain that real quickly, and I will just take, uh, uh, let me just take an example. Let me just do this. This is one of the most powerful things that Dr. Doug Small teaches uh, concerning prayer that if you will learn to do, will change your prayer life. Let let, let me show you. And I'm taking taking a random scripture. I'm taking uh, Genesis 37. So I would read in my personal time, so Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. And then I would simply say, now God, I want to be settled God, I want you to settle my heart. You would pick out key nuggets from that verse. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. Father, I pray you would help me to tend to the responsibilities that you have called me to do. That's called praying over an open Bible. You just take a verse, you read it, you pull out a few key words that spoke to your heart, and then you pray them out loud back to God. Many people struggle with their prayer life because they don't know, maybe, maybe they just don't feel comfortable uh, of, of creating that verbiage. This is a good way, a good pattern. It's called praying over an open Bible. So this is what we're going to do. For 10 days, we're going to have no meats, no sweets. We're going to pray three times daily, and we're going to pray over an open Bible Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 through 17. Once you read that text, you will understand how important it is for this juncture of our city, for our community, as well as for our nation and world. It's a worthwhile prayer, and I hope that you will at least consider joining me in a Daniel fast or some sort of uh, intermittent fasting so that we could be people of prayer. Remember, when you fast, the goal is not to lose weight. The goal is to take the time that you normally would spend on eating and preparation of food to spend that time in prayer. We need that discipline. We need discipline in our life. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for me. It'll be good for the church. It'll be good for our nation. Amen? Hope you'll join us as well online, uh, and you will participate in the Daniel fast. All right, if you have your Bibles, we are going to get started And I will do my best to give you new material today without spending too much time visiting where we have been. But I do feel constrained to catch you up in case you have forgotten what I have shared to this point or you have missed. We are walking through the Ten Commandments. We will be looking at number two and number three today, the second and the third commandment. Before we get there, before we get there, I want to give you some, here's a question that I'm often asked. In the New Testament, should we be uh, subservient? Should we obey the Ten Commandments? Hopefully, I can answer that um, with, 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 with a good answer uh, from the Word of the Lord. Then God gave the people all these instructions. Remember Exodus chapter 20. We've read this a number of times. The people, all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt. 
the place of your slavery, you must not, you must not have any other God but me. Remember I shared with you, and this, I, I felt like this was important. I'm still a cook. I'm still a cook without instructions. I'm a better cook with instructions. Remember that as we work our way through this. Okay, Genesis chapter 37. In your Bibles, you have the story of, you have the story of Joseph. You have the story of Joseph telling his brother his dream. And I spent the whole service talking about the dreaming Joseph and the dream that he had. In fact, in your Bibles, in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 18, the text reads, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. And the text read, here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him. And one of the things that I want to drive home about this text as we get into the people of Exodus 20 is not everyone likes a dreamer. Not everyone likes a dreamer. You've got many people that will discourage dreamers, but they won't fan the flame of dreaming. And I've encouraged you, I've encouraged you, whether it be going back to school, whether it be adopting that child, whether it be taking that mission trip, be people of dreams, launch that business, think outside the box, start that small group, do what God has called you to do. I gave you several things concerning your dream. Don't expect everyone to be excited about your dream. Not everyone's going to be. Some people's going to call you foolish. Some people's going to say it, it's never going to work. You see this in Genesis 37. Remember the promises of God and forget the ridicule of the haters. Who was hating on Joseph? His brothers. That's who was hating on him. Enjoy the truth. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? You need to be reminded of that. Accept the pain before the coming out party. Joseph's going to have a wonderful coming out. But before he comes out, before he becomes uh, all that God has intended for him to be, he is going to face intense, intense, intense ridicule and persecution. And number five, meet with the one who gave you the dream. He will strengthen you. If God has whispered something in your heart, continue to talk to him so he can, so he can reacquaint you with that same passion that he gave you. All right. We then move to Genesis 39. Genesis 39 is the storyline of when Joseph was sold into slavery. So now he's in Potiphar's prison or Pharaoh's prison. If you're going to rise, rise like Joseph does in Potiphar's house, there's four things that you must do. You must risk your life knowing that God is with you. You must insist on doing the godly thing no matter the pressure. Remember Potiphar's wife. She made a strong plea for him, but yet he risked his life on doing the godly thing. Serve God no matter the accusation and enjoy the blessings of God. Enjoy being his favorite. And you will see this. You'll see this story in Genesis 39. Remember when you get to Exodus 20, uh, 20, we are talking about this family. We are talking about these people that are now settled. Joseph had been sold into slavery. Rise to prominence. We are talking about these people. Last week, we talked about everyday idolatry. What happens when we seek ours, when we only enjoy ours, when we love ours, and we forget God and we forget others? What happens? We begin to live in what I call everyday idolatry. We begin to commit idolatry every single day that we live. Once again, you can find the Ten Commandments beginning in Exodus chapter 20. In verse 30. Let's get started with a few things, maybe a few reminders. Should you keep, should you keep the Ten Commandments and what does that look like? Remember this saying, this is something I've shared with you many, many times, something very, very important to me. The cross works both ways. 
got to remember this. The cross works both ways. If you look on the screen, here is three examples of crosses that you would see or, or that you would have seen or commonly used by the Roman army, uh, army in the first century A.D. All right, you see three examples of three Roman crosses. First of all, note that all three crosses are going to have a vertical beam. Historically speaking, this is what they would look like. Not only will they have that vertical beam, but they will have the horizontal beam right there going across. So you've got a vertical beam and you've got a horizontal beam. The cross works both ways. Remember, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about loving God, loving one another. The cross works both, uh, both ways. The first four commandments of God, look on this screen with me, if you can see it. I know it's small font. Uh, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me, right here. You shall not make yourself an idol, right here. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, vertical beam. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, the vertical beam. Should we keep the Ten Commandments? The last six commandments are going to deal with what I call right here, the horizontal. The horizontal. Look at these six. Honor your father and your mother, right here. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover. So here's what you see. You see the vertical beam, and you see the horizontal beam. You see the 40% of the Ten Commandments deals with your relationship with God. 60% of, your, uh, of the Ten Commandments affects the way that you are going to deal with one another. I find, I find in my walk with Christ, He is usually not the problem. It's usually we. This is 60% of the time where we mess up in this relationship with God is between us. It's between people. 40% of the Ten Commandments have to do with my relationship with God. 60% has to do with the relationship that we have with one another. So should I keep the Ten Commandments? Let me give you uh, two different translations, same verse of Scripture. Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Dear friends... You always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important, work hard, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. More familiar translation. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. A lot of talk, a lot of, a lot of sermons, a lot of lef- lessons have been about Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Well, 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 pastor, should I do this? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, pastor, can I do this? Well, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Here's what we know. Here, here's what we know, my friends. We know that God in heaven does not tell you, you figure out how to live this life, and you do whatever you feel like you need to do, and therefore you're saved based upon whatever you think. Oh, that would be foolish. We are told in John chapter 14, Jesus Christ is the only way. So this is not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying, you figure out what salvation means to you. In the Old Testament, from Genesis all the way up to uh, uh, all the way up to the giving of the New Testament, right before the Old Testament goes silent, here's what you'll see repeatedly from the prophets of old: Salvation belongs to the Lord. Look up those words. Look up those words and see how many times you read the words: Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then once again in the New Testament, we know that salvation belongs to the person of Jesus Christ. This is not what Paul is teaching. He is not asking the people of God, and he's certainly not asking Prentice, 
saying, hey, group A, you figure out what salvation means to you. Group B, you figure out what salvation means to you. Group C, why don't you just do what you want to do and then we'll all, it'll all come out because you get to work it out yourself. I don't think that's the intention of the Apostle Paul. Are we supposed to follow the Ten Commandments? Paul gives a command using a strange, it's a strange and often misunderstood phrase, uh, misunderstood phrase, work out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This remark speaks of ongoing obedience, ongoing obedience for those already saved. It's crucial to note that Paul is not telling them to work for their salvation. He's saying, work out your salvation. Not work for your salvation, work out your salvation. Salvation is a beautiful thing that happens on the inside of you. And Paul says, now let that inside work be expressed on the outside. The statement implies a need to live out, to practice, to demonstrate and exhibit the salvation which the believers have in Jesus Christ. So are we supposed to follow these Ten Commandments? Too many Christians view the Ten Commandments as impossible imperatives. I'll never measure up. Impossible imperatives. In fact, um, I, I, we will, when we get into everyday language, everyday idolatry, everyday murder, everyday idolatry, a view from the New Testament, Jesus did not lower the standard of holiness. He actually raised the standard of holiness. You said of old, thou shalt not murder. But I said, even if you have anger in your heart towards one another, Jesus did not lower. Now, he did come to fulfill the law. Remember, work out your salvation. These fruits of your work tells the world, I am born again. It's the fruit that follows the believer. Moses is standing on Mount Sinai. And Moses will look back. In Exodus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to chapter 19, when God gave the Israelites the law, their status as being the people of God has already been solidified. They're the people of God. But in Exodus 20, he gives them the commandments. Look at what he says in Exodus 19. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I've been in relationship with you. I've been carrying you during difficult times. And then in Exodus 20, he says, I am the Lord, your God. I want you to feel that today, that he is your God. He is your God. I have brought you from the land of Egypt and the place of slavery. I am your God. Relationship was in place before the 10. The rescue is not based on our goodness, but on the goodness of Jesus Christ. That's very important. I'm going to skim through this because I want to get to the content uh, today. Moses gave us the ten. Moses will give us the ten commandments. Today, by the end of the service, we will have covered three of them. He will give us the ten commandments. Jesus will give us... Watch this, Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied. Jesus replied. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Guess which beam of the cross Matthew 22, 36, 37 covers? The vertical beam. Do you see it? You must love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. He said, this is the first and greatest commandment, and then Jesus teaches. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. So what does Jesus do? He summarizes Moses' ten in two statements. Love God and love others. I'm going to love God and I'm going to love others. This is the greatest commandment, and this is the second commandment. And once again, the cross works 
both ways. You remember when John says, John says right before writing of Revelation, he says, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he says, I will know that you love God when you have love for one another. Love, I'm going to love. It's, it, 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 it just doesn't work any other way. Moses gave us the 10. This is important before I transition. Moses gave us the 10. Jesus gave us the two. But regarding salvation, Jesus is the one. You got, you, friends, you got to hear this. Moses gives us 10. Jesus gives us two. But never forget, Jesus is the only one who saves the soul. The beautiful works that come out, come out of this one that has been established with the person of Jesus Christ. Abide in me and I in you, Jesus says. The works that you will do are greater because I go to the Father. But remember, he teaches, he teaches, apart from me, you can do nothing. So all of the good works that we do only show that we have been saved. They certainly don't save us. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. I will die for this verse. Do you hear me? I will die for this verse. I will not die for a lot of things. (laughs) There's not many, many things I would say we'll fight over this. This is one. This is what we call a close-handed argument for me. Well, Pastor, I, 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 I believe churches should have Sunday night services. Okay. I'm not going di- to die over it. We'll talk about it, but I don't put it in my fist. There are going to be some things that you've got to grab hold of with the right hand and close it and say, it is a value that I will not compromise on. What are those for you? What are those for you? One of mine is this right here, is that there is salvation in no one else. We cannot compromise and de-glorify or defame or de-celebratize the name, the good name, the faithful name, the honorable name, the matchless name of Jesus Christ. All other names pale in comparison, but the name that has been given under heaven which man will be saved by, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. We cannot defame that name. Jesus told him, I am the way, I am the truth and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Israel's obedience to the commands was to reflect God's nature to the world. Israel's obedience is a concrete example and expression of the devotion to the commitment of God. The Ten Commandments will show us what a God-centered life looks like. The two commandments will show us what a God-centered life looks like. But the one Jesus Christ saves us, and that's the positional truth that is found in Exodus chapter 19. This is so important for you as a body of Christ. So important. Paul says, much like Jesus did, that the Ten Commandments are the way for God's people to love one another. When we love, we fulfill the commandments. The Ten Commandments have been central to God's people in the Old Testament, central to God's people in the New Testament, central to God's people throughout church history. And they shall be central to us because we will love God and we will love others. We will love God and we will love others. All right, everyday idolatry. Number one, self. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20 and 3. What I didn't want to do today and through this series, is give you a list of 10 things for you to walk out and say, okay, if I obey these 10, I go to heaven. No. If you know Jesus Christ, you go to heaven, my friend. Come on. Amen? Hey, if you're a part of the family of God because you know Jesus Christ, can you give the Lord an ovation of praise? I know Jesus. Yeah. All right. So that's important. Everyday idolatry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Everyday idolatry. Let's look at number two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You must not make for yourself 
an idol. This is number two, everyday idolatry. We worship, number one, ourselves, command one. It's a problem. We worship ourselves. Command two, you shall not worship idols. You shall not worship graven images. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or in an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. How many remember these little army guys? Do you remember the little army guys, the green army guys? Yeah, you remember them? So live screen, uh, I'm going to probably go missing for a few moments. But what I used to do in the house is I used to set these little army guys up. Did anyone ever do this? Ever do this? Yeah. If you were really good, you would set up zip lines through the house. I used to have zip lines in the house um, until you have a dog and then your dog eats all of the army men. But I used to really like these guys. And what would happen is, uh, is I would set these guys up and we would play war. And you would come along and this guy would like beat that guy and knock him over. And Toys. Toys. Um, the word graven image, just let that kind of hold in your mind for a moment. Graven image comes from the King James Version that is found in Exodus 20 and 4. And uh, this is the second command that Moses gave to the Israelites. And he's saying, don't worship, don't worship any idols. Don't worship any graven images. A graven image would be something that was carved out of stone, carved out of wood, or carved out of metal. It could be a statue of a person, or it could be a statue of an animal. And as with any kind of worship, the object of adoration uh, ined- inevitably controls us. Now, everyday idolatry looks like this. Most likely, none of you have a problem with graven image worship in regards to a statue on your front porch that you bow down to. Most of you don't have that kind of issue. Most of you don't have a plaque or a mural on the wall that you would fall, fall low to and bow. You don't have that type of everyday idolatry. But here's the kind of idolatry we do struggle with in America. Toys. We love our toys. I mean, we love our toys. And and remember what I said. As with any kind of worship, the object of adoration inevitably controls us. So we begin to love our toys so much. And you know what I found out about these guys? These guys got old very quickly. This... This type of relationship with the green army men wasn't very sustainable. In fact, I kind of put them on the shelf. If you watch the movie Toy Story, you can learn all about them. But I began to do something because they got old. Old toys would always require new toys. Because I'm, I'm looking for hope and I'm looking for help in toys. I'm looking for satisfaction. And I found that toys get old. And then that old toys calls me to require new toys. My old iMac is really struggling with identity right now. Let me, let me tell you why. I've got an old Mac. It's a 21 and a half inch, I think. Sits on my computer, and I love, I love Mac products. You know that, Mac phone. And, but it's really having a hard time right now because I got something new. Because the old, the, to, the old toy got old, and it got really, really slow. It got really, really slow. And so I replaced it with a new toy called a MacBook Pro. Guess what's going to happen to the MacBook Pro? It's going to get old too. Have we learned yet that the car gets old? Have we learned that yet as the people of God that the cars get old, the boat gets old, the jet ski breaks down, the toys 
really do get old, and if you're looking for satisfaction of toys, you will only have to purchase another one to make you happy again. Have you noticed that the smell, the new smell, wears out? Have you noticed this yet? Because here is the everyday idolatry that we are struggling with. Is the latest gadget and the latest game or trinket that will make us happy, that will make us feel successful. That is what everyday idolatry looks like in 2020. Because like I said, I hardly doubt any of you are bowing low to a shrine. But some of us always have to have a new outfit or a new pair of shoes, or a new purse, because at the end of the day, it just makes me feel better. Let me tell you what you need to help you feel better is an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. It'll never fade. It'll never dissipate. It'll never be diluted. What you need is an encounter in your soul with a living God to take up residence that you commune with, or as we said through the years, that you can talk with and be with. This is what we need. Toys get old. Old toys require new toys. And before long, you forget the toys you even have. You forget about them. I forget I even have those men. I, I even forget that I have these guys. Why? Because I've replaced them with I replaced them with G.I. Joe figurines. Because they had moving parts. Remember those guys? And they would beat up Cobra, King Cobra. <laughs> toys get old. Old toys require new toys. And you forget the toys you have. And lastly, seeking happiness in toys won't last. Seeking toys and happiness won't last. Here's what happens medically when you purchase something. If, if, if you're finding happiness and contentment from those things, here's what happens. It releases a chemical in your body, and it makes you really giddy and excited. Whew. Dopamine and adrenaline is released, and you're getting, oh, oh, yes, I like this. I like this feeling. And so guess what? Because you crave that, guess what you do in order to get that feeling again? Do you know? You do it again. I'm going to tell you something that will equally, some old timers need to help me today. When you pay that credit card off, you start feeling, ooh, man, that feels good. You know what I mean? When you get debt free, you feel, oh, wow, that feels good. That feels good. Hmm. Make it your ambition to love him, to love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and not to find, not to find all of your hope in the green army guys because <laughs> they're going to get old and the dog's going to chew them up let's find our satisfaction in him and in here not in graven images not in toys and gadgets and games they'll get old as a testimony of faith as the people of god just do this for me if you have ever in your life if you have ever in your life purchased something and it made you feel good after you bought it, let me see, Ayant. Anybody besides me? Yeah. Anybody have buyer's remorse and said, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. FPU leader just raised his hand first. Me, me. Yeah. Toys won't make you happy. Here's what Jesus says give me about five, six minutes. Don't store up treasures on earth. Where moths and set, uh, where eat them, and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I might have shared this with you, but I, I, enjoy, um, I enjoyed a time in my life working at a, a suit shop. And we sold high-end suits. And high-end suits would maybe have some, uh, maybe a light mix of wool, uh, 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 silk. But the lighter the material, the wool, the better they would fit. And so one of the things that would really bother me 
is when I would go to my closet. Uh, pa- Pastor Moffat and I were talking about this one day because it happened to him. He had a really nice suit that he loved. And this passage happened. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. <laughs> and little moths will eat holes in your wool suits. And you'll be like, what picked my suit? Nothing. It was a creature <laughs> that went into your closet and ate a hole through your garment. And Jesus knew just what he was talking about when he said where moss and rust will corrupt. We don't want holy garments. <laughs> where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? I've got six army men. I have today sitting, I have today sitting the Jose Canseco Donruss rookie card. For those of you who do not know Jose Canseco, he was on a stretch there with him and his bash brother, Mark McGuire. Their baseball card skyrocketed. And I had one of the best cards. I, 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 it really was. And it had went up to several hundreds of dollars. But you know what I held on? I held on to that thing. I held on to that thing. It's worth like a buck today. <laughs> it depreciated. I have, at one point, about 50,000 baseball cards. Not a great retirement investment. <laughs> Now, any of you little ladies who, who has maybe a son who collected some Mickey Mantles, if they're still stuck up in your attic, let me know. I'll be happy to come and retrieve. Those are the ones you want, not anything from the 88 era. But, but look, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and, let you, and yet you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? But I got a Green Army man. In fact, I got six of them. I got six Army men. Is it worth your soul? I got a new, 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 I got a new. Pastor, I had to get toys. Everyday idolatry. They get old, they require new toys. You forget the toys you have, and seeking happiness in toys won't satisfy. They won't make you happy. They won't make you happy. In fact, if I could just get this into your soul today, I'm going to stop here. I'm not even going to talk about the third everyday language. I'm going to stop right here. Number one, here's what Jesus is concerned about. Don't have any people before him. Command one, love him with all of your heart. Don't have any people. Everyday idolatry is about people that you place. You place yourself before God. And number two, everyday idolatry, graven images, is about things. iPhone Pro Max, pretty good camera. There's a new one coming out. So this will be old soon. This will be old. We used to call it, you can't keep up with the Joneses. Ever heard of that? Can't keep up with the Joneses? This is going to get old. My shoes are going to get old. I love what God did for the children of Israel. He says, I kept your shoes from wearing out and your clothes from wearing out. Even while you were roaming in the wilderness, I kept the garments together for you. Did you know I've seen that in my life? Did you know, real quickly, let me just testify, real quickly, and one of the hardest points in me and Angela's life, her, her dad's here, and, 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 and he, he blessed us when we moved out to the Midwest with a, with, a, with a minivan. And we love that minivan. Did you know we prayed for that minivan? Because there was times on the mission field, we didn't have money to fix the minivan. And if something would happen, we had to pray for it. I know this sounds strange. <laughs> it sounds strange. We had an Isuzu rodeo at one point. Something happened. Some mechanic would probably know today. It wouldn't go forward. It would only go backwards. That's a problem in St. Louis. (laughs) You can't drive backwards. (laughs) 
the gas, the, 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 uh, the, the, gas t- the, the gas was messed up. It, it just meant we had to pray for it. And here's what we prayed. God, don't let, even though it's old, don't let it wear out because it's all we got. It's all we have. Reminds me of the apostles when they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I given to thee. I'm praying that your, I'm praying that your old doesn't wear out. Why? Because the new ain't going to make you happy. The new ain't going to make you happy. Pastor, anything wrong with having new? No, 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 nothing wrong with it. Just don't let the new have you. Fair enough? Anything wrong with it? No, it's okay to update. Just don't let the new have you. Own the new. Don't borrow the new. And don't let the new own you. You own the new. Um, next week, Lord willing, we're going to do the second commandment. Everyday language. Thou shalt not use the name of the Lord in vain. What does that look like? Would you stand with me? The most important invitation, and if I can greet the online community real quickly, um, the most important question that I have for you today is do you know the one Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Lord, Savior, and King? Can you testify today that you know Jesus Christ? I hope that you'll share this teaching, that you'll like this teaching. If you're real ambitious, love this teaching. But testify today, if you're online, that I'm a child of God. Tell somebody I am a Christian and share your faith. Let me pray for those online. Lord, I want to thank you for that online community that has been joining us for the last hour and a few moments. I pray that their heart was encouraged by the Word of God. I pray that something I said, something I shared, would be significant in the building of their faith. I pray for them now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen and amen.